What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to the Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys and gals, what's going on? Don't ever wait for your doctor to order blood tests. With Private MD Labs, you can get your blood test prescription online in under one minute and go directly to over 4,000 lab locations in the United States. They offer every blood test imaginable at affordable prices with highly accurate results from tried and true state-of-the-art blood testing diagnostics. In fact, I've been using Private MD Labs for more than a decade. Their blood tests are much more in-depth and accurate than any at-home pinprick or worthless saliva test. Skip the intrusive doctor questions and get the exact tests that I recommend. Be proactive and get your panels today. Go to privatemdlabs.com forward slash JC to take 15% off your order. Send you guys love and light. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. I am Jay Campbell, and you are watching the Jay Campbell Podcast. And I am extremely excited today to be joined in my virtual StreamYard studio by a man who does not need an announcement. His books are going around the world, and a lot of people know who this guy is. And he is the great Paul Wallace. Paul, man, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? Jay, good day. I'm fantastic today, and all the better for being with you. That's awesome, man. So Paul is coming all the way live from down under. So what time is it actually for you right now? Oh, it's about 10 o'clock in the morning here, but uh, we're we're Thursday morning. So we're in the future here. Exactly. He's in the future, proving that time does not exist, Paul, outside of the third exactly. dimension. Exactly. Uh, so anyway, let me, let me give you guys Paul's bio for some of you guys who don't know him. And again, uh, I've read Paul's, both of Paul's books. Um, they are profound. They moved me to reach out to him. I've actually put a bunch of tweets, uh, on Twitter recently, uh, from threads from his book, you know, examining what he's talking about. And a lot of people were asking about this. So I know a lot of people are going to be watching this, but anyway, Paul's bio, he's an international bestselling author, of course, whose books probe world mythologies and ancestral narratives. I love that for the insights into human origins, human potential, and our place in the cosmos. He is a very popular speaker. You guys can check him out on Gaia, on The Fifth Kind. Uh, also researcher. His documentaries and collaborations are literally watched by millions worldwide. That is true. And very fascinating and interesting, Paul is a senior churchman. As a church doctor, he was a theological educator and an archdeacon in the Anglican Church in Australia and has published numerous titles on Christian mysticism and spirituality. His 2020 book, Escaping from Eden, was hailed by George Norrie, and you guys all know who George Nori is, as this generation's chariots of the gods from Danikin, propelling Paul onto the international stage as the go-to guy in the field of paleo contact. I would agree. Paul's latest book, The Scars of Eden, which is what I just finished, is endorsed, of course, by Eric Von Donikin, also right in the front of the book. Uh, so, Paul, it's an honor to have you here today. Uh, today, for everybody, is Wednesday, December 8th. We are almost out of 2021 and 2020, and we are heading into... What I want to say is the age of Aquarius for sure and the golden age and the new earth, but we definitely most likely have to get through a little bit darkness before there is dawn. But uh, Paul, let me just ask you before we jump into the amazing bullet point discussions that we're going to talk about, uh, just give me your perspective right now of what is happening on planet earth. I mean, you're in the epicenter of the dystopia of <laughs> Australia, right? I mean, you really are. So, I mean, I, I, I'd like your perspective and then just where are we going? Well, you say the dystopia of Australia, and I think 2021 ought to be the proof for everybody that there is far less fiction in the world than we generally think because, That's right. you know, a bit more 1984, anybody? Right. I mean, it's the Hunger Games. It's all kinds of narratives we're familiar with from the world of fiction, and we're watching it play out in front of us. So I agree with you, Jay. I think we are going to see a little bit more darkness. But I also share your other perspective about what uh, 
some people refer to as the age of Aquarius. There is an amazing shift happening right now, right. which I'm experiencing through people contacting me yep. who've read my books. And I'm finding people right across the generations are saying to me things like, I no longer believe what I believed 10 years ago. And I've got such an appetite on me to find out what's really going on, to learn who we really are, to find out what we're really capable of. I hear this from guys in their 70s yeah. who have yeah. bought out of the paradigm they've been in all their lives and are experiencing this incredible awakening. I've never seen anything quite like this in my lifetime. And so I think, yes, we've got a bit more darkness to come, but there's a whole lot of light happening as well. And that's what I find really motivating. Beautiful. Uh, obviously, I'm in total agreement. Let me ask you, and this is only a question that someone like you, in my opinion, can really ask ask because of your you know, Anglican church background as, a, as really as a theologian. Um, what is happening to people in the Abrahamic religions and even really the Eastern religions right now? Are they having a crisis of consciousness, a crisis of their faith? Or are they just naturally evolving? I know it's a tough question for you, but you're the guy to answer it. Well, that's a really interesting question because about 10 years ago, you might remember the Roman Catholic Church held a colloquium under Pope yeah. Benedict the Sixteenth to discuss yeah. the implications of contact with other civilizations. Mm -hmm. And so there is a major Abrahamic religion saying, let's look at some really profound things to do with our place in the cosmos, right. Right. our whole right. concept of God, our rereading of the Bible. And they obviously felt confident that as a religion, Roman Catholicism could adapt to contact with all the implications of that. And the fact is that whether you're looking at Christianity or Islam or Judaism, there is plenty of information in right. the texts of those religions <laughs> that ought to prepare people for a more complex universe. It just takes enough spokespeople to come forward and say, yeah, this was always there. So there is a lot more room for flex, I think, in those religious communities than people often give them credit for. And a huge proportion of people who contact me, we were saying this just before we came on the air, yeah. are people who are from a religious background in right. the Abrahamic religions who said, I've always seen this other stuff in our texts. I've always yeah. seen it this other way or had this experience that has shown me there was another layer to these stories. So I think all that's going on as well. So when people talk about the world religions, they're not monolithic phenomena for a start. Yeah. They're full of individuals. They're full of a spectrum of theologians and spokespeople. And there's as much going on in those circles as anywhere else on the planet. Beautiful. I have so many of your uh, sections of this book highlighted, which I'll get to. But let me ask you again, you're, you're the guy. Who is the force, not the, not the ET or interdimensional beings. We'll get to them, but in, in physical form in physical reality in particle wave duality, who is the class of let's say priest or secret societies that is hiding the truth. And let me give you this quote. Sometimes the information in the world would journey hidden in plain sight encoded in the metaphors and imagery of esoteric poems and myths. Paul, who is doing this? You know, people talk about the brotherhood of the snake or the serpent race, or there's all these different things that we come from Egypt. Again, the secret society is evolving and now to the Jesuit orders. But who is that? Who do you think was in charge or placed in charge of encoding all of this for so long that, as you said, it's in the ancient texts, it's in the Bible, it's in the Enuma Elish, it's in all of these things, these things that stand out about the gods. And and who and what they might be, you know, clearly they were technologically powerful, but but who is charged with covering all of this up? Because they did an amazing job. Yes, they have done an amazing job in different cultures all around the world and for centuries. But there are probably a couple of things going on there because there are different kinds of hiding. There's there's covering up because you want to keep people in the dark. Right. And then there's covering up because you're wanting to protect information of course. that could be gotten rid of. Right. So, for instance, when the Gnostic Gospels were buried in the desert, 
it was to protect that information for future generations because they held information that, that the empire didn't really want getting out there. And so you do have secret societies who carry secret information and might not share it for generations. And then they'll bring it out at a time when the public's ready for it or when they can leak it back through art or through literature. And so you have esoteric societies that exist to do that. And often they've evolved from the remnants of priesthoods that empires tried to destroy. Right. And so an example of that would be what we now call the Popol Vuh, which is a book written in the early 1700s, which was an expression of the Mayan right. uh, stories of origins, stories of human potential that Portugal and Spain thought they'd destroyed and got rid of in the 1500s. And so you've got a secret society of priests curating that information for 200 years, keeping it secret to keep it safe, and then it gets revealed. But in that same story, you're beginning to see there are other forces who just don't want this wider information about who we are and our real power, our real place in the cosmos, because they're trying to manage and control the world. So right. obviously right. the forces of empire do this. Whenever you invade someone else's country, you want full spectrum dominance. That includes uh, the news outlets, the media. If you are the empire, you decide what is true, what is false, what's taught in the schools, uh, and you decide what narratives are going to be destroyed, covered up. When Portugal and Spain, for instance, went into Central and South America, their, their goal was to delete and replace right. the indigenous narratives, yeah. replace it with Catholic orthodoxy. Incredible. Britain going into different parts of Africa did the same, not by executing priesthoods, but by giving the impression that anything other than Christian orthodoxy was primitive or right. was idolatry. And right. so if you've got a great grandma who's curating ancestral knowledge, well, she's a witch doctor. You should be ashamed of her. And so sometimes it's cultural forces like that. Or in the 20th century, 21st century, we use ridicule to silence people who've got something to say that governments don't want said. So it's usually those in power who actually want to silence the old narratives through any of those means. So that means civic authorities, imperial authorities, right. political authorities, or religious authorities, all trying to control the narrative. And very often they want a much cleaner picture where God is at the top and then the prime minister, president, emperor, just under there, <laughs> right. the bishops in the middle. I mean, in Britain, the bishops sit in the House of Lords, some are in the middle, and then all the people sit at the bottom doing what they're told. Every empire wants a society like that. And if you've got other narratives saying, oh, no, every human being has far more power and autonomy than that. Look at what human beings are capable of. Right. Well, that's not really a story they want getting around. Right. So there are many reasons why they would suppress those older stories that are more complex and sometimes more empowering. And they would suppress the modalities often that get people in contact. So, uh, you know, ancient initiation ceremonies of indigenous peoples illegalized right. in North right. America, illegalized. Right in right. australia right. people taken from their ancestral lands so they can't do initiation and get that other information right. or heighten their cognitive abilities it's all an attempt to keep society operating with a general population whose only job is compliance the and matrix that's really matrix yes going. exactly and i think that's the agenda that pushes out narratives of contact close encounters and paleo contact Okay, so I want to go deeper with you on that. Um, you know, you talked about the engineers, and again, that was my Twitter thread. But, you know, let me you, – have you been to um, the Sacred Valley of Peru? Oh, not yet, but that okay. is – Okay, so I'm about to tell you. Yeah, so it's the most amazing place. So my entire story of who I am and how I went down the consciousness and the vibration – and just the esoteric, you know, realm. I mean, I wasn't always this guy. I mean, I've always been this guy reading, you know, people like you, but I was an author, you know, writing about physical health optimization and all sorts of things, fasting, hormones, all these things. And I became, you know, whatever you want to call it, internet famous for that. But, you know, it was this 
that I was always the real passion, right? The light of being inside of me was pushing me to do this. And when I went to the Sacred Valley, Paul, everything changed. And so my question for you is, you know, in the context of what you just said, their narrative of the matrix completely is eliminated when a human being travels to the Sacred Valley and goes to Cusco and goes to Saxe Human and goes to Machu Picchu and goes to, uh, you know, all of the megalithic stone complexes that are found all through these areas. And I will, I will tell you this. I went to a lot of the quote unquote Catholic churches and cathedrals that are also found, you know, they, as they say, built in the 15th or 16th century in, in, in Peru, again, by the conquistadors and whoever else went there and instituted in, uh, Christian orthodoxy. And Paul, I'm telling you, the story is all, I'll just say it BS because there are doors in these places that are 20 feet tall. And they are made of the most amazing architecture. And this is not, I'm not talking about Machu Picchu, you know, going back thousands of years, we can't even date them. I'm talking about 15th and 16th century design in these cathedrals. And there's no way that the indigenous Chequans of Maya, who are five foot four to five foot seven, were building these. So when you see this and you're standing in front of these, you are like, well, my God. I mean, again, it's just common sense. There were giants here. Who would yeah. have ever built something like this? Right? So it just destroys their nonsensical narrative instantly. And again, as you know, because you've, you've been told you haven't been there, but you've been to other mystical places. <clears throat> the energy of the place completely changes everything about who we are as energy beings ourselves, right? Because that's all we are at base essence is energy. And you're you're there in this frequency of the sacred valley, again, at 9,600 feet and higher. And Paul, it's the most, it's astonishing. I, I mean, I literally came back from there and I said, I don't care about any of the things that I've been doing. It's about raising human consciousness. That's all that matters now is raising human consciousness. And I'm going to do everything I can, uniting with amazing brothers like yourself, and raise the frequency. Talk to people about the importance of what it means when you say it, you have to raise your vibration, you have to raise your awareness, yes. you have to raise your consciousness. And it's it just, you know, when I left there, I realized that officially and kind of already knew, I think all of us are kind of walking that path, but when I, it was official that everything that they tell us was bullshit. And I, you know, at that point was like, okay, I'm, my focus is talking to people like Paul Wallace. I mean, that is everything that I'm going to do. I want to bring this out into the open. So as it's now happening, right? So many people are starting to feel this energy and frequency of awareness and they're starting to ask questions, but it's mind blowing when you go to the mystical places, the ancient sites, and you see for yourself again, with your own eyes, you can't unsee it. And so yeah. that's when realistically, there's no possible way that people can, you know, believe in the narrative of, like you said, that, you know, the orthodoxy, I mean, it's, it, it just destroys yeah. it. It does. And it is, it's an incredible experience to go to a place like that because you just know at a visceral level was well, not that, you know, you know, that you don't know. Exactly. Like all of a sudden you're in a place of, I have a hundred questions right. <laughs> right now because of what right. I'm experiencing here. And it's incredible how all the threads that you just described are really interwoven because yes. your journey in terms of health optimization absolutely overlaps yep. with the narratives you're going to find in Central yep. and South America that are to do with our origins and to do with contact. Yes. Because yes. if you want uh, to perceive what's going on at another level, uh, or even think fresh thoughts, or move towards contact experiences, the very first thing the local elders are going to teach you is to change what you're eating. Exactly. That's exactly right. So they, they really do connect. And it's something that I've come to experientially, that as I've gone uh, further down the rabbit hole of my explorations, it has impacted 
my diet because I just felt in my gut, if I can use that language. That's literally, by the way, truth. Because your your that's... microbiome, right, is the biggest brain now that we know. It's yes. even more important than this brain. Exactly. And we've used that language for so long. You know, I, <laughs> right. I know it in my gut. And now we discover it's true. Right. So my gut is telling me, yeah, if we're going to be on this journey, then you can't be eating crap. And yeah. that's just step one towards the kind of experiences that some of the greats had. Uh, I, one of my heroes is Plato, and oh, he's yeah. very open that a lot of his most far-reaching information came from altered states of consciousness. Sure, sure, and the prelude sure. to those were an alteration in the diet. Exactly. So those all connect. But yes, as soon as you go to these sacred places, you're full of questions. And if you ask the tour guides, uh, very often they will tell you the two stories. Well, the official answer is this. That's exactly what they say. Well, do you but, want the U.S. sanction but... story? or do you want... <laughs> And then you get told. This happened to me when I was in um, Greece years ago. Yeah. Uh, it was the, I wasn't on a research mission. I was just on a holiday the during temple. the Greek islands. Yeah. And so we came to um, Crete and we were learning about the ancient Minoan culture and discovering oh, yeah. they were really advanced people. Giants. Their technology, um, their built technology was amazing. They were building uh, stone buildings with air conditioning yeah. systems in them. Yeah. And so I asked the guide, well, who are these people? Where did they come from that they were so smart? And he said, well, the Minoans were the descendants of Minos. Minos was the hybrid child of Europa and a non-human right. entity. All of yep. a sudden, we're in a story of abduction and hybridization, exactly. which, exactly. you know, most people, mainstream society, you hear those words, they'll think, oh, this is a $50 from National Enquirer story. No, you get taught that as history in it's Europe. That's the history yeah. of Europe. Europe yeah. is named after an ET abductee. And so in that context, the guide wasn't even saying, well, I'll give you the official answer, then I'll tell you what I think. It was right. all the same thing. The official exactly. answer was paleo contact. Right. And, the, and isn't it fascinating how all of this has, again, been just in the recent times of the last, say, 20 years, edited out of history. Hey, guys, what's going on? If you're looking to level up your life from a mind, body, and spiritual perspective, join the fully optimized health private membership group today. There is no better place online to discuss hormones, peptides, fitness, fat loss, supplements, and even raising your consciousness with an elite tribe of men and women. You also get to speak to me directly every single week in the Ask Me Anything. Join today. Go to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up and I'll see and talk to you soon. It's hard to even find this kind of information now, Paul, because you know, whoever, oh, I want to get to, I'll ask you who this is, but uh, from an, you know, cause again, it, it, this is such an, it's such a short, powerfully, you know, elaborated book, but I, I want to ask you and you, you know, you never really came up with an answer in the book and obviously it's an opinion question, but who do you think, are there multiple engineers, meaning are there, you know, astro theological paleo you know uh, ets again interdimensional whatever you want to call it extraterrestrial you know i always like to look what jock fillet talks about where it's more of a extra sensory perception it's more of a shift in time again these beings have some sort of mastery of the waveform of particle duality in third dimension meaning they can they can alter yeah. this waveform but who do you think they are i mean obviously you talked about the sky people the anunnaki the anuna but like, who do you think they are? And then the bigger question is, are they still here, you know, physiologically, or are they here from their hybrid offspring? Or the last question is, are they in, in middle earth, in, under the earth, in, you know, in, in underground cities? Well, if we listen to our ancestral narratives, there's a whole spectrum yeah. of entities types of entity demographics that have been involved in project earth for a very long long time project earth, exactly so if you look at uh, project humanity and the development of homo sapiens if you and if you only go to the bible you'll see that there are a number of different interventions yes. through prehistory and history yes. to get us to what we are today and right. really all 
our indigenous narratives around the world confirm right. that story that there have been a number of visitations, uh, some helpful, some which have upgraded us for a better human experience and some that have upgraded us so we could work in their minds so that you've got that great long story right. and different demographics involved that way. I think many of those stories are about very flesh and blood entities who are very similar to us, which I might come back to in a moment. Uh, but then there are other stories that talk about entities that are quite different, that are energy based beings that interact with us and that have a hand in human affairs and then feed off the uh, emotional output of biological entities like us. So that would be the iconic stories, for instance, yeah. that get hinted at in the Gnostic stories. Um, you've got interdimensional entities yeah. who yeah. are named or hinted at as well. So you've got that great spectrum. And then I think you've got some who are present today. I mean, just before Christmas, hey, Meshed, the Brigadier General, who was Israel's chief of space security yeah, for 27 years, it. he yeah. talked about an intergalactic federation. So that means a whole range Star of Trek. neighbors. That's exactly what it is, the Federation of Planets. That's right. Except we've got a spectrum of agendas, some which are right. friendly to humanity, some which are indifferent, some antagonistic, some who might absolutely hate us, a number who want to hybridize with us. Right. So there's this huge kaleidoscope of company that we're in right now. Right. So there are a number present, but often people ask, well, when I read the Sumerian stories, which are pretty graphic, really, about our contact right. with Sky people right. and ETs, what happened to them? Are they still around? And I think the, I'm not sure is the answer to that question. Yeah. We have a right. lot of company yeah. uh, that come from different places. Our ancestors specify the regions of space many of them come from. But I think some of the Anunnaki stories from out of Sumeria speak to a time when we were colonized for very oh what can i say relatable reasons i mean when we invade each other's countries it's because we want something that's in the land or on the land right you know we want the sugar we want the cocoa we want the minerals sure. and so we will go in dominate that country with a very visible presence for 100 right. years or so but as soon as we've got all the minerals we want, or if we set the commodity prices, the exchange rates, the banking systems, by that point, we can go home and still benefit from sitting at the top of the economic tree. Right. And I think when we're looking at the Anunnaki stories, it's that kind of an invasion that we're looking at. Yeah. But I would say this, that there is such a continuity of story around the world about handover of power from right. non-human governors to human yeah. kings and queens right. that I strongly suspect that the great majority of our monarchies and priesthoods date from the time when we were governed visibly by yeah. extraterrestrial presences. Right. Right. They went home in the way I've just described and they left their priesthoods and their monarchies behind. Yeah. And that's, I think, the world we're living in that's why i think we have covert contact and you know just as a general member of the member of the public i would be i suppose along with someone like michael Sala or the late ed mitchell right just wanting to know well who's at the top of the human tree who's in right. these conversations who's representing right. us on the intergalactic federation right. Right. and in whose interests are, are decisions being made. And that's why I, I applaud someone like Haya Mashed coming forward. I mean, he's a pretty right. authoritative figure of course. to be saying that. Yeah. Because I think by putting that on the table, he is inviting the human race to come into this conversation of saying, we want our place at the table. Right. Thank you very much. And well, I, I, I actually believe that's possible because I think we do have friends on the Federation. That's what I was just going to say. So it, it's so my opinion would be that he comes forward because he can. And that's the key is that there are a lot of their, what do you call it, Manchurians here who are allies of the human, you know, uh, evolution, the, the human physical, you know, meat flesh puppet evolution. But 
you know, to that point, Paul Hellier, if you remember Paul Hellier, who recently died, right? I mean, you know, he was the Canadian foreign minister. I forget what his title was, but, you know, minister he's of defense. Uh, exactly. He's authored similar, right? So he's authored all sorts of stuff before he died uh, talking about this. And he said the exact same thing. You know, he talked about the tall whites. Uh, I mean, so he, he is another guy like the guy in, in Israel who, you know, obviously had the courage, if not the audacity to come out and talk about this stuff when it was really not allowed to be talked about. But I think that's, I think you're right. I think that um, we're here because they have slowly, it's the, it's the frog in the pot, right? It's not boiling, but it's just slightly bubbling over a couple hundred years. And now it's boiling. And now people who have eyes to see and ears to hear can see all sorts of things. And Paul, you know, we, we can't not speak about this. I mean, and I know you've seen this and, and, uh, and a lot of people have seen this, but it seems like the, the, let's just call them the parasitic energies, the left-hand path is now the gloves are off. They don't even care about using technology to hide themselves. You see some of these CEOs, I won't main name names so that we don't get this channel deleted. But they may be involved with the uh, the lollipop, and whatever the person is is like either shape shifting or like moving around. I mean, you've seen this. Like people are like, yeah. "Oh, it's CGI," or you know, stuff is unraveling. It's a bad, you know, a, a edit or a shot of the film or something like that. But it's like, dude, I've seen this person. I know you know what I'm talking about. I've seen this <laughs> person morph. In multiple interviews. So to me, it's like either their technology is failing as this new energy sweeps over the planet and we do move into this age of Aquarius, or it's worse than that. It's more Machiavelli and they don't even care to hide anymore. But I mean, it's clear, dude, as you've said very well, I may add that there are, a, this is a hodgepodge. This planet is a giant melting pot of beings from the cosmos. Some benevolent, yeah. some malevolent, some neutral. I mean, I would say a lot are neutral because, again, there's no real intervention. I mean, right now with the darkness, like you said, the dystopia of Australia. I mean, I have you know people that work with me uh, in Canada, and I'm hearing the stories up there now. I mean, you guys in you know Australia and Canada are very similar. I mean, it's insane that this is happening across the world, Paul. And there is an intervention. Now, again, you know, my thought, we're going back to the Galactic Federation. I mean, what do they say? It's like universal non-interference is the rule. But clearly the dark side doesn't <laughs> abide by that rule, right? Exactly. I think there's a lot more leakage uh, yeah. out of that federation because I think there's, I think there's some argy-bargy going on right now. Yeah. Clearly right. there's not a total pattern of non-interference. Right. We are seeing interference. Absolutely. There's been a real acceleration of close encounter phenomena, yep. UFO phenomena, or yep. UAPs as we now call them. Yeah, and I right. think that always represents that the, the truce uh, on the Galactic Federation isn't holding quite as tight as some might wish it to be. You're talking about shape-shifting there. I, I would say to people, I'm not an expert in CGI. <laughs> so I can't necessarily call it when we're looking at one thing or another. So I would just say, listen to what those people are saying. Right. And right. is it, does it show any compassion or fellow exactly. feeling with yeah. the human race? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, you know, well, listen to I mean, Paul, because... I've had people that say muscle test it, right? Use applied kinesiology on, do oh, they sure. test strong or do they test weak? And, I mean, you're talking about the CEOs of the V-Makers and that stuff tests as low consciousness as anything on the planet. So, of course, you're right. It stands to reason if you have that assumption, then your assumption is most likely they're not pro-human. You're right. They do not have compassion and empathy. And I think if, if you make that the test, if you look for behaviors that are pro-human or totally cold to human with humanity, with no fellow feeling, exactly. uh, you know, there are places where you find that yes. in the world. Yeah. And then you have to ask, what's it doing there? And right. I think it probably comes back to what I was saying before about the powers in the deep past leaving their structures and their deputies behind. Right. I think that's the story, really. Yeah. And I think many of our paradigms I'm as well, you. I mean, just, just to get beyond, uh, you know, stories about elites that we don't know personally, I think 
you could talk to your neighbors about politics and you'll be hearing a mindset to do with what leadership looks like right that was actually formed in the era when we were governed over by entities with no exactly. compassion towards us because they weren't human so when right. people talk about strong leadership right very often what they mean is leadership with no empathy that's exactly leadership right. that will force something through even if it costs thousands of people their well-being or their lives that's strong leadership that's i remember really a few true. years ago in in great britain a new prime minister came in i wasn't living there at the time but my parents live in the uk and this new pm came in and he said um you're all going to work for less and work harder with fewer rights and benefits you're going to be treated like trash and you're going to thank me for it because that's what this country needs well it wasn't what the country needed at all but many people looked at that and said oh look strong leadership, strong leadership right why do we call that strong it's why incredible. if somebody comes along and says look we're not going to make any decisions until we've reached an agreement about what Incredible. brings the best benefit to the most people. And we will move forward when we have that agreement and understanding. We call that weak leadership. Incredible. Collaborative. What's that? You know, our whole idea of leadership has been formed in this period of paleo contact when we were colonized by non-humans so that now we, we don't have to be shapeshifters to right. run with that model so you'll find this in politics you'll find it in church leadership where there are people who are if i could say completely human running with a quite inhuman model of leadership right. and i think that's the reason why hey guys and gals what's going on if you're looking to use peptides make sure you go to my number one source limitless life nootropics for healing with BPC-157 and TB-500 or fat loss with Ipamorelin, CGC-1295 and AOD-9604 to immunity with TA-1, thymus and alpha-1, Limitless Labs, a huge selection. Go to LimitlessLifeNootropics.com and use my code J15 to take 15% off your purchase. I send you guys tremendous love and light. So as you discussed in your book, I'm in total agreement, 100%. And again, you brilliantly uh, elucidated in your book, but it's almost like a collective trauma. Yes. And it's multi-generational, transpersonal. It literally, it, again, remember the Bible, the sins of the father. I mean, I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about something that was so inculcated in human, you know, just the consciousness of humanity, like you said, that we were slaves of the gods and the gods were these high technology giant you know maybe reptilian maybe humanoid maybe combinations of both probably combinations of both i mean again you know that's something we, we should probably examine a little bit you know i'm uh i don't know if you if you're familiar with the work of pierre sabak but you know he's no. written he, so i'll connect you you guys should talk but he's written some profound books uh the murder of reality and holographic culture and he's actually going to be uh, meeting with Rex pretty soon too. But uh, he talks about this, um, by the way, he's an, etymolo an etymologist. And, and so he studies the root language, uh, the, the root meaning of language. And oh, he, wonderful. Oh, That's no, he's powerful. unbelievable. No, he's an incredibly, one of the smartest guys on planet Earth. He's 170, 180 IQ, just brilliant. The, that, that was my red pill, etymology. What do yes. the words actually mean? What do they actually mean? Yeah, everything is, as you know, inverted. Well, so his book, just to give you a quick summary, like his book, The Murder of Reality, talks about what he calls the Serpentinegua. And they are this clandestine race of beings that he calls are serpent-like or have been taught by serpent beings uh, to run everything, again, from behind the veil. And again, through the hidden code, which he calls the dialectic of language, you know, the, again, the root language mm -hmm. origin of meaning. And so it's phenomenal. And you will love this book. You will literally geek over it. I'll send you a link to it. Actually, I'll just connect you to Pierre and he'll just send you the book, but it's, it, it's, it's profound, but you know, that's the question is who were these beings that they then were able to infiltrate all of the secret societies at one point or another. And, and you're right. I mean, that's now, you know, they're, as you called them, uh, what was the word that you used? Actually, they're 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 um, they're pa not patriots, but whatever word you use, I forgot. But like basically, they're they're, they're signatories, right? So they're now all here, 
and they rule truly clandestinely from the shadow. And you will never know who is truly one that has power. Because as you know, Paul, none of these people that are in our political structure have mm-hmm. actual real power. Like the real power brokers are completely veiled. Yes. We have no idea who they are. Yeah. And we are, flowing from what you're saying before, we're hardwired to play ball with this. Yes. I mean, our ancestors say we were actually engineered to be a compliant species who would work for superiors. So what those stories say is that every one of us is born with a vulnerability to being managed and manipulated and dominated. And then you mentioned the word trauma. I think that's, that's really profound because when I started drilling down into the anomalies in the biblical text, I discovered that the stories that overlap between the Bible and the Sumerian, they're all stories of trauma that our ancestors experienced. Traumas to do with planetary resets through cataclysms and trauma through being engineered. And we've got memories that I believe are memories of pre-technological ancestors experiencing labs where we were being engineered. Well, that's a profoundly terrifying experience for any creature to go through. And that memory gets carried on our genes. I met a guy recently at a pharmacy and uh, he was getting my script ready and he was very slim. I couldn't help noticing And so I said, what's your secret to staying so slim? Because at my age, that's an interest of mine, if you know what I mean. And uh, so he told me his story. And he said, well, my family were traditionally not thin people. And then my great-grandfather was in Auschwitz. Wow. And survived. But the only reason he survived is that his body worked out how to live and be extremely thin. That's what the body had to learn. And then when he got out of Auschwitz, he had children, and they were extremely thin. And they had children, and they were extremely thin. There you go. So the trauma that he experienced um, was carried through the generations on the genes. And I was reading something this morning about uh, trauma being carried down seven generations. Seven generations. A generation of rats in a particular way they'll respond to the stimulus seven generations later with a fear response and i think that's where our patterns of compliance and right. worshiping the one percent and you know keeping up with the kardashians or worshiping the royals or just being cravenly obedient to a horrible boss i think that is where all that comes from it's carried on our genes yeah no, you're 100 percent right. Again, it's a genetic engineering. I mean, look, I mean, I think you know, just saying that flashes all sorts of thoughts in my mind of being a little kid and going through the grocery store checkouts and you know, seeing the National Enquirer and the Sun and all of those things and how they would just net Paul always it was royal families. It was the news, like, like yes. it's obvious that they have controlled the a quote unquote narrative. The media, the popular media, the popular press, and now they, you know, obviously they have a lot of control now of everything from the airwave standpoints and technology and internet, but there's alternative channels, thank God. Uh, Otherwise, this podcast would not happen. But I mean, it really is mind blowing because you're right. That would be such a repetitive thing for them to continually browbeat us with, with like stories of the royal families. Because Paul, who gives a shit about the royal family? I know. I know. I mean, think about how they push that out in front of us. Like just to, it's, and, and you're right. It's part of the system of being conditioned and engineered and then literally brow beaten that that is relevant. And so it does become relevant over thousands of years. Absolutely. And I mean, it's recent in my family. My gran began her working life as a maid in the big house wow. uh, where she lived. And it was the era of Downton Abbey. And in the big house where my gran lived, I think there were five people in the family and Incredible. 50 staff whose whole lives revolved around making things work for the five so they didn't have to put their own clothes on uh, or put their own man. toothpaste on their, on their own toothbrush. 
And I remember hearing uh, a group of ladies being interviewed who'd begun their working career that way. And by the way, you know, if you got your daughter into that big house to work 24 seven for those five people, you'd count it an opportunity. Right, this is exactly. a really good deal Greatest for your daughter. So you ever. thought, right. and so they're interviewing people who began their working life that way, just as my grand did. And the interviewer wow. said, you talk as if, you feel the five, the family, were better than you were. Oh, well, they were. <laughs> That's the answer. And this is all these decades later. Oh, they were. Well, no, they weren't. These are the no, they weren't. If they needed you to put toothpaste on their toothbrush, they were not better than you. Wow. Uh, so it just shows how deeply this programming goes. And I think it's very interesting you listen to the teaching of Jesus or Buddha or Lao Tzu, any of the greats really, and they always come away talking about not deferring to superiors, not worship, right. but that we express compassion towards one another. Right, right. Jesus reframed the whole idea of uh, loving God as loving your neighbor. Exactly. Right. Uh, worshiping God means you love and serve the most vulnerable around you. And if we could really latch onto that, because so many greats have said it and we fail to click with it, but if we could really catch the idea that we empower ourselves when we serve one another, not right. when we serve superiors, exactly. yeah. then our society would operate very differently. We see glimpses of it in human history when right. we, we do catch a glimpse of it, when suddenly someone starts running a stakeholder company for instance, you think, oh, there's another way of doing this. And these people are actually well paid. They're living good lives. But it's always the the blip. It's always the glitch in the matrix. It's always the exception because the mainstream is just running a different way. And it's all pyramid shaped with all the benefits trickling up and not trickling down. It's just like in religion. They, what they have done is just disempowered people to always worship the external and whether the external is Santa Claus in the sky, you know, or the lab coat God, as I call him, my doctor says, right? <laughs> like whatever it is, they have, they have just, again, I, I love to say this, Paul, don't hate the player, hate the game. They are ingenious yes. beings. Yeah. They are ingenious yeah. beings. And that, again, it makes more sense that yes, they genetically programmed us, Yes, they were superior intellectually with us than us. They did give us our DNA. So now we are becoming them, right? And that's why some of them don't like this because we have gotten off the range. You know, people like you and I, and obviously folks, there are millions of us, you know, who are now advancing our consciousness at a very rapid and accelerated rate and don't take, you know, any of that colonialism plantation mindset that they have obviously positioned on the, the, it's called the herd, you know, the great majority of humanity, but it just, once you start working, as I say, on your inner game, right. And you start contemplating, you start meditating, you start becoming introspective, you sit in nature in silence, you do the work necessary to truly find, as I call it, the light of being your higher self, you know, the energy and frequency of all things, God, you know, divinity, whatever you want to call it, you start to realize that all of that, meaning the external that they have brainwashed into us isn't really what matters. You know, you only have control over yourself, but so many people, and you know, I always go back to the, to the myth. And by the way, I was raised Catholic, right? So, I mean, I was so brainwashed in that, you know, my mom, I mean, my dad was an altar boy, you know, his dad was an altar boy. So, I mean, that's all part of it. I mean, I mean, it, it, like you've been saying this entire podcast. And so it, it's the same thing. It's, it's giving up, now for what may be again when what they tell you is you know the afterlife or the future and oh so yes don't yeah. ever embrace the now they never let you understand that right now is what matters and that the magic happens exactly. because it's present you know so it's like exactly you have to get away from that paul there's there's another layer to this as well because i think that we assume that um Beings with advanced abilities who can ma manipulate space, for instance, or with advanced tech, must be better than us. Right. Uh, right. 
And that's not necessarily the case at all. It just means they've got better tech. Right. Although I, I think we have better tech than we're generally told. So let's That's just put that too. in the mix as well. That's true too. But for thousands of years, indigenous cultures have said that some of our visitors are here hybridizing with us right? because there's something about us right. that is better. Right. They want something we have in their gene pool. Right. And at the moment you start joining the dots between these stories of hybridization from around the world you begin to respect humanity in a right. new way we, we right. have so much company yeah. around us because there's something special about us our level of consciousness our emotionality our creativity our capacity for compassion these are all things that are special and that are attractive to some of our neighbors and i think when you begin to realize that we are a special species on a beautiful planet, Right. it just gives you even more of that impulse of, all right, we need to make our presence felt. We need to do better exopolitics. We need to make the most of those who are with us and on our side, who are on that council, who do have better tech, and say, well, this, this is what we want this is our right. planet we are right. part of this conversation and i do believe that there are presences who've been around us for a long long time oh, yeah. holding that place for us so i'm not someone who gives into uh, apocalyptic terror Me neither. Me neither. Uh, i Me neither. believe there is a way forward for us and for our planet if we can be a little bit more intelligent about things and i do think there is Something to be said for, you know, obviously we we talked earlier about who's representing us on the council. But in the meantime, there is plenty of communication going on between our neighbors and regular human beings. And it's been part of mystical and spiritual experience um, forever, for as long as they've been human beings. And there are some who are very good at picking up on this, who might describe themselves as channelers or people who are intuitives. But I think all of us have the potential to get good information and good guidance from the company that we keep. I'm coming to hold the view that I hear from the elders of indigenous cultures, Mm -hmm. particularly those who practice initiation, Mm -hmm. who believe that every one of us has a little cloud of company with us. Excellent. There for our benefit that we're actually not here all on our own without any help, that we do have access to higher information, higher consciousness. And if you want to know, well, how do I thrive in this dystopian world? I believe the help is there to give you your answer for yourself, for your family, and if we will allow it at a a larger societal level than that. So we've got to plug into that, begin acknowledging that. If indigenous cultures can do that, if my Aboriginal Australian friends can do that, if my Native American friends can do that, then we all should be thinking in those terms of invoking the help that's here for us. It's beautiful, Paul. I mean, to a couple of points, uh, everything is vibration. You're either in resonance or dissonance. And we're obviously human. We have egos and the egos are designed to keep us around and keep us in survival mode when things happen. But obviously we're not sure. 2000 years ago now on the Serengeti. We don't have saber tooths you know, looking to eat us. So we're not like looking back and forth. So the, the advanced consciousness being walking around on the planet now has two choices, right? We, we can react out of fear, which is what most people do because it's the easy way out, or we can choose to check in with our higher self and respond, as I say, out of love, right? And choosing to respond out of love definitely takes checking in. Does this serve? Yes, it does. Does this serve me to respond in such a way? Because again, most people reactively choose to just emotionally have an outburst. And and you and I have done that many times in our life. We're human. We're no one's ever perfect, but you have to be able to learn how times end so that even in times of distress, when the ego is going insane, you can still choose to respond out of love because it doesn't serve you. And then the other thing that you said, which again is very profound is, we have to get to an awareness that we're all connected at a soul level. Okay. It doesn't matter your skin color or your age or 
what you believe. I mean, at base essence, we are all part of this, whatever you want to call it, this holographic you know, universe of, of souls and, and all the souls are connected. We're all, you, you know, everybody always talks about, you know, the hive mind or whatever in the dark side of things, but we're talking about at base essence soul, God has given us all this access point, but we can't access again, what I like to call the higher self until we learn to check in, to go within, to yeah. do the things that each of us can do again through meditation through sitting in nature, through introspection, contemplation. I mean, even, you know, going out and walking with your dog and not speaking and just listening, you know, letting that higher self or that light of being or whatever you want to call it come to the forefront. And when you can do that, Paul, um, you literally can create what I like to say, you know, Neville Goddard said, you're heaven on earth. We're all capable yes. of creating heaven on earth right now, even as you know where you're where you are and i'm in california so i mean i'm definitely not as bad as you guys but i mean you know it, if there's any place in the states that's getting there it would be california so we're all amidst this quote-unquote dark night of the soul but our choices now determine our future and our current state of awareness i absolutely agree i think for me i find it really important to get out into nature yes every day Exactly. And uh, if I can be out barefoot in nature, so much yep. the better. If it's a sunny day and the sun's on my skin, so much the better. Right. I, every time I do that, I feel like I'm recalibrating. I'm breathing more deeply. I am beginning to experience the benefits of the company that uh, I'm living in, my invisible team that supports me, and and the benefits of being a creature of nature in nature. It's the most natural place to be. And, and I think we forget that when we're not in that environment, we're not in our natural place. Right. And worse than that, if when we're indoors, we're just watching the TV, then it won't be long before we're very depressed and very angry. Exactly. And I think a lot of people have actually switched on to this during the experience we've been going through over the last couple of right. years. More and more people have realized, whoa, if I keep listening to the news every day, I'm going to go under. Right. And more and more people have woken up to the fact that you have to decide what emotional state you are going to carry with you as you step out the front door. What energy are you going to bring to all your interactions as you move around, if you're allowed to, um, and interact with other people? So being more intentional about that, I think more and more people are cottoning on to that. And I speak to so many people from all kinds of different start points who are coming to the view that they do have help. They're recognizing mm. uh, that they're getting inspired thought, making intuitive leaps, uh, getting hunches that turn out to be really helpful. And some people will say, uh, I think I must have a guardian angel. Some people will say, oh, I think my ancestors are supporting me. Right. Some people will say, sometimes I feel it's like my future self is right. counseling me through right. this particular crisis. And I think all that I'll could be up. true. Yeah. And as I've gone back to the Bible and other ancestral narratives, I find our ancestors use that kind of language all the time right. in the New Testament. It says that each one of us is surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, very mm -hmm. interested in how we're running the race marked out for us. There's another verse in 1 John 4 that talks about testing the spirits in which the writer clearly expects the early Christians to be getting communication from other entities. Right. And that some of that information is going to be really good and really helpful. But not all of it, he says. So keep your wits about you. Keep your sovereignty. Know that you're an autonomous being. Weigh up for yourself if this makes sense or not, but fully expect to be getting good information. And those aspects of Christianity were edited out because yeah. think how empowering that is, where all of a sudden you're not dependent on your priest or your politician or your teacher to tell you what's what. And you've got like a cosmic team giving you access to higher information. That is an incredibly empowering world to live in. And it's the world I'm discovering mm -hmm. through the world of ancestral narrative. 
Beautiful. Paul, man, you are an amazing guy. I really appreciate you coming on. I'm going to share real quick uh, some of your URLs. Um, so if somebody wants to work with you, obviously podcast with you, uh, purchase your books, like where, where is the best place you will send folks right now? I mean, obviously you have the fifth kind show on Gaia and the YouTube channel, but uh, wh where do you send people right now? Well, first off to find the books, you can go anywhere that sells books, Amazon, Kindle, Barnes and Noble, Hive, Book Depository, get hold of the scars of Eden, yes. escaping from Eden there. And then if you'd like to be in conversation with me, I'm always in the comments on the Paul Wallace channel right. on YouTube, uh, the Fifth Kind TV on YouTube. People often contact me because they want an interview or they want to do coaching. If you do that through my website, which is paulanthonywallace.com, Anthony with an H, Wallace, W-A-L-L-I-S, paulanthonywallace.com, go to the coaching page or the contact page, and I'll be really happy to get into conversation with you. Paul, this is an honor for you to come on here. So you guys and gals watching this amazing podcast, please support the amazing folks that come on the show. Go to Paul's website, Paul Anthony Wallace, W A L L I S dot com. His social media, of course, is also the same spelling Paul Wallace on YouTube. And he has the fifth kind on uh, YouTube. And then the Facebook is Paul dot a dot Wallace. Um, Paul, again, I'm humbled. I'm grateful. I look forward to another conversation with you. I'm going to connect you with Pierre Sabak. So this will be oh, profound. So guys and gals, again, please support the amazing person. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see you guys very soon.